Uh, my title uh, that's listed in the uh, uh, program was maybe a little bit, uh, I realized, probably didn't get to the point quite as quickly. So um, this talk's going to be, I think, quite different than the previous three talks. Um, it's going to be a lot more historical, talking about uh, situations that have happened um, in, in the past where people have designed very similar economic systems. Um, and it's going to be illustrated via the lens of algorithmic trading. Um, we're going to try to make this uh, pretty concrete. Um, so yeah, and well, I don't know where ZX is, but I'll try to not bleed into his time too much because I know we're like half an hour over. Uh, so just a very tiny background. Um, I spent the last 10 years working um, in ASICs, which is kind of how I might figure out a little bit about Bitcoin. Um, algebraic geometry and finance uh, at uh, two places, D.E. Shaw and uh, at a high frequency market maker called Vatic. Um, and basically I started Gauntlet when I started realizing the kind of people were like being a little like uh, not so statistically uh, honest uh, in the space. People were kind of like choosing numbers randomly and you know, weren't doing kind of the modeling that was at least to the level of like what Charlie described yesterday uh, for Uniswap. Um, so yeah, so maybe roughly speaking, we're gonna go through a few things, um, but first we'll kind of go through an overview of the problem and then we'll talk about the history of why um, electronic markets uh, from the 80s to now kind of resemble a lot of the advances that we've seen in cryptocurrencies, um, more so than say the internet. Um, I think that, you know, there's always this view that, oh, cryptocurrencies and blockchains will be the next internet, but at least what you see right now on the ground looks a lot closer to uh, markets in the 90s. So um, basically, complex technologies have, have been used in finance for a long time. Um, I know this sometimes is a, a little bit surprising um, to, to people uh, in this space and in the tech, uh, but, you know, there are definitely regions of finance where uh, the newest technologies are used and, and people are much closer to research. Uh, token economics is definitely financial modeling, but it's a little bit different because these decentralized systems change the interfaces and change some of the assumptions. Um, and sort of probabilistic simulation is a, a good tool for kind of, kind of estimating this type of stuff. I couldn't pick, figure out which of these two slides I like better, so I chose both of them. But I'm going to give you a quote from my fav favorite journalist, uh, who is Matt Levine. He's a former derivatives lawyer who uh, writes for Bloomberg. Um, but he has this, this view that uh, you know, people in, in cryptocurrencies generally tend to be relearning the lessons of finance's past just faster. And uh, I definitely think that, that that seems to be the case based on and most of the lessons we learned. So where are the similarities between trading and cryptocurrencies? At the end of the day, when you get down to like what your client is doing or what the virtual machines are doing, they're figuring out how to prescribe a precise value to each packet that's received. So every TCP or UDP packet you get uh, has some well-defined monetary value. Uh, the monetary value is tamper resistant because of the cryptography. So whether it is a cryptographic hash function or whether it's zero knowledge proof. So, you know, MIMC, some type of more complicated hash function. Um, but the network value is, is driven by incentives and competition. Like the, the network value that ensures that the network stays live and accepts new transactions. And the network value that ensures that if a bunch of nodes drop out, there's still always enough incentive for new nodes to come online and to keep the network alive. But this is not the first decentralized packet monetization tool. Um, traditional electronic markets actually have a lot of decentralized features to them. Um, and the only difference is really the monetary value is insured by the Fed and the SEC. Um, and the network value, ironically, as we'll see, is, is, is quite largely driven by regulation. So let's go through a, a tiny history of electronic trading. So in the 70s, uh, NAS, the NASDAQ was formed. So that was the first electronic trading venue. Um, NASDAQ uh, has an abysmal like, acronym to say, I can't even like, say the whole name correctly most of the time. 
It, by 1983, you started seeing retail investors getting access to electronic trading. Um, basically, news groups, so like Usenet uh, boards, would, people would post prices. So you could say, hey, I want 100 shares of GE at a dollar. And someone else could say, I'm willing to fill it at 99. Um, the savings and loan crisis uh, from 1987, which is kind of when a lot of options modeling kind of blew up. It was like the first example of where um, kind of the simplified models didn't work, uh, happened, was accelerated by electronic trading. Uh, volumes were about 100x what they were um, at the previous recession uh, jump. But between the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, we had a period where I would say that kind of resembled 2017. Um, basically, everyone could start an equities exchange. Um, if you had a data center and you had sufficiently good redundancy, you could basically start an exchange in your back backyard. Um, you could provide prices, provide quotes. There was no real regulation on this. And um, the Glass-Steagall Act kind of also implicitly had some, some terms that made this more favorable in the US. But what happened when this happened was you had a lot of fragmented liquidity. So kind of like what you saw with crypto in 2016 and 15. Um, the dot-com crash led to uh, a, a large loss um, in, in a bunch of these companies. Uh, and the biggest ones, the biggest exchanges that were formed, uh, Island and Arca got acquired by NASDAQ and NYSE. And then banks started acquiring some of the market-making companies themselves. But really, the big driver of, of uh, decentralization, in, uh, of synchronization, uh, in electronic markets was this kind of fabled piece of regulation called Regulation Neutral Market Service, or Reg NMS. Reg NMS turned being an exchange into a distributed systems problem because it, it basically said every exchange has to quote the national best bid and offer. And that means you have to go and go to every other node in the network, every other exchange that exists in the US, take all of their best prices, so let's say they're five exchanges, and one, three of them say a dollar, and another one says a dollar one, and then the other exchanges say a dollar five and a dollar three. You have to take the, the largest price someone is willing to uh, buy at and the minimum price someone's willing to ask at. And that means you have to go crawl through the network, get store all the ledgers from all, uh, query everyone's local ledger state, local ledger state being an order book, and kind of figure out the best consensus order book that uh, you're promising to provide. This regulation kind of killed a lot of the mom and pops uh, in the sense of people running exchanges in their, in their dorm room. Uh, that became much more unsustainable because you got fined uh, pretty severely for not providing the best price. And the financial crisis uh, aligned the incentives for high-frequency traders and market makers uh, with exchanges because basically volumes went down and exchanges revenues transitioned to co-location and data. Um, and so what happened over time was that most players in the marketplace realized they were uncompetitive uh, from the technology side. No one was building hardware. People weren't building machine learning algorithms that were sufficiently uh, you know, at the right capacity level from a you know, complexity standpoint. And you had the shift to where 80% of volume that exists being internalized by direct market makers and high frequency traders. So this is why Robinhood is free, by the way. Uh, they sell your flow to Citadel usually. Uh, and Citadel basically gives them a rebate if Citadel earns a penny. So if you say you want to buy 100 shares of Apple, Robinhood sells it to Citadel. Citadel, if Citadel earns a cent on it, Robinhood gets one third of that cent. And that's basically the revenue sharing agreement that makes it transparent to the user that they're not paying fees somewhat similar to how gas fee arrangements look right now. And in 2018, we started really seeing the rise of the direct listing. So a lot of the IPOs in the current market uh, started listing directly instead of like building a book uh, with traditional institutional investors. Uh, so electronic trading has kind of like changed how banks operate, certainly has changed how IPOs operate. But Pat, let's look at kind of a little bit about what packet monetization means. So market makers are rewarded by two real, uh, two real functions. One is how far they are from a rebate tier. So the revenue sharing agreements between exchanges and market makers 
give market makers um, a significant discount on transaction fees, sometimes negative. So the exchange pays you if you provide liquidity. Um, and so you as a market maker want to get your volume up as high as possible. And then you also want to provide price improvements. So you want to buy low, sell high, or you know, sell high, buy low if you're shorting. And uh, basically, the product of those two things is roughly what your, your profit and loss is. And this idea that you want to be the one who gets the most volume leads to this race, where everyone gets a packet from an exchange, and you, you compute some estimate in your model of whether you think you should make a trade, and everyone is running to, to go make a trade at the same time. This is actually quite similar to the proof of work competition model. Um, the difference is it's a latency versus bandwidth model. So in, in trading, it's really focused on latency, like how fast do you get to the market, uh, whereas proof of work is really bandwidth, how much hash power do you have. Um, but I did like this picture from the Princeton Bitcoin book uh, of F an FPGA mining rig in Georgia, the country, um, from 2012. Uh, and basically, people were still somewhat profitably mining Bitcoin on FPGAs until, until 2012. So it's kind of cool. Uh, so token economics. So fee rebates are wildly successful in every market that exists uh, that is an electronically traded market that's centralized. Um, even, even centralized crypto exchanges all offer tons of fee rebates. Uh, there's tons of, you know, the reason BitMEX is able to have so much more liquidity than Deribit is strictly because of this. Um, but decentralized crypto platforms have had a lot of problems with fee rebates. So there's, there's a very famous example of this uh, contract called Fcoin, which was offering over 100% rebates. So, you, if you traded enough, you would get your transaction fee back plus, plus a bonus, which means they were inflating the currency a lot. And then basically you had this huge crash because everyone was trying to get their volumes up and then dump as fast as possible. And so it ha in, decentra in the decentralized world, people haven't figured out how to make these revenue sharing agreements much more transparent. So I think the correct way to think about it is to really think about it in terms of some amount of algorithmic game theory and some amount of uh, kind of continuous time modeling, like kind of what Charlie was talking about yesterday with Uniswap. So at the simplest case, the algorithmic game you want to think about is everyone observes an initial state, S0, on the public ledger at, at a certain time. Each party optimizes over the state space to figure out what they think the best state for their local objective is. Every state transition that you can take, so placing an ad order, placing a cancel order, calling a smart contract function, costs a certain amount. And there's some variance to that cost. It's not, it's not exact. And your goal in compute and communication complexity is to A, efficiently find the fastest set of, the most efficient set of state transitions to your ideal state, such that conditional, uh, subject to kind of the constraint that you need that probability to be much higher than reaching other states. And the network value for both token economics and for trading is really comes from independent parties optimizing their own local microeconomic transitions while also maximizing social welfare. So what do I mean by social welfare? Social welfare is kind of whatever the macroscopic observable of the system that is trying to be optimized. So it might be income inequality. It might be the Gini coefficient. It might be liquidity because you actually want people to get in and out of their currency at the sizes that, that are you know, desired or not. But what is kind of the formalism that exists for kind of looking at this? Um, real, realistically, it comes to algorithmic game theory. And uh, you know, you know, we have one of the experts uh, in the field in the room. So <laughs> kind of anything I say, remember, uh, you, know, if some, if you should ask him real questions, not me. Um, but two examples of kind of this microscopic, I'm selfishly optimizing uh, and kind of, but it actually works out macroscopically is the VCG auction, the Vickery Clark Gro Groves auction, which is basically something where if everyone has quasi linear utility, which means that they have positive, they, they feel better when they pay less than what they think the value is of an object linearly. Uh, then you basically can show that by doing a second price auction, the mechanism uh, maximize, people maximizing their own valuation maximizes the global kind of allocation. 
On the other end, you have this other impossibility theorem, which is actually very cool, um, which is uh, the Meyerson Satterthwaite uh, theorem, which basically says there is no ex post efficient uh, Nash equilibrium um, when you are market making, so posting prices uh, for bids and asks, uh, when traders have independent valuations. And you can see this kind of diagram of the design space of these different types of macroscopic um, desires. So you may want ex post efficiency, you may want like incentive, certain types of incentive compatibility, and they don't overlap perfectly. So your design space, whatever mechanism you choose, has to somehow uh, figure this out. And crypto and trading are interesting in the sense that they have social welfare functions that are time evolving. Um, and these can be subverted due to mechanism flaws. Front running DEXs, having a governance token that has no value. Uh, and then in, in normal markets, there's this thing between public and private data that kind of is a weird sort of mechanism flaw. So if we just go through, we'll just go through kind of like what this looks like for a couple things. In trading, you know, each person's objective is dollar PL, social welfare, liquidity, tightest spread. Who enforces this? SEC, CFTC exchanges. What are your state's order books, your local account state, your local ledger? And uh, state transitions or add, cancels, modifies, active fills. For Uniswap, um, and again, you know, I, uh, you know, there was part of me that wanted to put more stochastic calculus uh, in this talk, but I figured it's, uh, once we have one person already doing it, we don't need to. Uh, and basically, Basically, we kind of have a similar set of uh, objectives. The difference is that the social welfare now is all token pairs have maximal liquidity uh, for small size trades. And uh, you want to maximize each denominated PNL subject to gas cost restrictions. Stable coins are very interesting because you have multiple types of users who all have different types of behaviors and different utilities and objectives. Arbitrageurs want US dollar PNL maximized. Users really want to just store their wealth without losing it, um, without getting inflated away, without having the price crash. And governors, in the sense of like a governance type of token, they, they want to profit from governance appreciation, fee deltas, burn mechanisms, so BNB, Leo, Maker, those are three different versions of how this appreciation might happen. Um, and you know, the social welfare objectives really just don't depeg very often and don't depeg by very much. And there's many different measures you can use for this, but at a very high level, that's what it looks like. And again, the contract enforces the social contract and the states are everything in the contract. So as the show us previously, we monetize single packets. Now we monetize aggregations of packets in a block, which is many state transitions, which gives us a much larger state space to, to kind of sort do this optimization problem over. And you know, the bespoke thing is really the uh, chain analysis uh, kind of attribution attacks. And uh, yeah, it, it turns out that there's a lot of weird restrictions from algorithmic game theory that show that you can't solve these things exactly. So we come to simulation. So why simulation? Um, number one, estimate the number of steps until you have a winner in a, in a game. Um, this happens a lot in reinforcement learning where you can't actually do this because it turns out your state graph has tons of loops and you get into a tit for tat type of behavior and in these iterated tit for tat games, there's no winner sometimes. Um, estimate the computational complexity. Well, you know, as much as we all love Brouwer's fixed point theorem, I don't think people are happy to see PPAD as the complexity class of something that you have to deal with. And the last thing, prove that you're epsilon close to a social welfare minimum. This is, again, runs into this curse of dimensionality problem where in high enough dimensional processes, you're going to have expected exponential minima, exponential numbers of minima. And like in neural nets, you're not so sure if any minima is equal to the best minima or good enough minima. So stochastic simulation is used uh, both in agent, the agent-based world and the macroeconomic world. Um, the macroeconomic world is something like Black-Scholes or a Heston volatility model, something like closer to, to what people use for valuing real estate, options, et cetera. And you're not guaranteed to find equilibria, but you do find useful estimates, and you really do find these phase transitions. So this 
this is kind of a simplified view of what a phase transition looks like in a, in a physics model, something called Ising model, where you can see kind of no consensus up top where everyone's kind of random and you know, kind of in the bottom there's kind of this notion of, of consensus. Uh, there's a blog post where I formalize this. Um, and I'm almost done, so this is basically, you know, what are the pros and cons? The pros, you know, it's computationally efficient, tractable, uh, and it can be statistically rigorous, you know. Uh, you can apply Cheegers inequality, you can, you can bound mixing times, you can do your traditional Markov analysis. This is not like something where I choose a prior and I can't tell you whether it's a consistent estimator. Um, the cons, it's an exact, only kind of tells you something's wrong, and it relies on your parameterization of the search space. You could do the fully machine learning route, but uh, I will say in trading, if you don't simulate against the real infrastructure and you have a too high capacity model, you will lose money. <laughs> uh, and at the end, of, my friend Noam, who uh, worked at Facebook on poker, uh, one this like was the first uh, made the bot that does the first uh, beat the first humans at poker has this good quote that markets are really like go except the board is changing at every step and the last very last slide I have really is uh, how does simulation affect adoption um, basically you what happened was the Black Scholes equation once introduced increased options trading significantly until the savings and loan crisis, which is when volatility smiles, if any of you ever trade options, were discovered. Um, and then you saw the rebirth of options trading right around the dot-com boom, and then this huge growth after that due to the ease and efficiency of electronic markets. Um, I could quote any option really deep out of the money if I wanted. And uh, once flow internalization happens, so this is a picture of Ken Griffin of Minority Report, uh, evil villain, uh, you saw things kind of level off. And us, we do this, we work with a bunch of people, we do everything from network simulation to economic simulation, and yeah, that's it.